The views on a breath of fresh air podcast reflects the parties involved, and we encourage you all to use it as a conversational tool that will lead to personal studies of your own. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Welcome to a Breath of Fresh Air podcast. Here with your hosts, Earl Roberts and Nakaz Gay. As a young person, Christianity can be so foggy, like smoke in the mirrors and so unclear. But we're here to bring you a breath of fresh air. Maybe I can finally get my opportunity to kill David at this feast. Surely he will be here. Hmm. That's strange. David isn't here. His seat's empty. Ah, oh, something must have happened to make him unceremonially unclean. I mean, come on, I'm the king. I invited him to my feast. Why wouldn't he be here? Surely he's unclean. Hmm. So it's the second day of this feast, and I still don't see David. What is happening? Jonathan! Why hasn't the son of Jesse come to the meal yesterday or today? Oh. Hey, could you pass the, could you pass the grapes? Yeah, so, um, David, he had a festival in his hometown of Bethlehem, and his brothers commanded that he was there. I told him it was cool. He asked me for permission to go, and I was like, yeah, man, you can go. Have a festival with your brother, you know. It's all good. I'll tell the king. I've been meaning to mention that to you. Hold on. What? You son of a perverse and rebellious woman! Don't you know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother who bore you? You imbecile! As long as the son of Jesse lives on earth, neither you nor your son nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die! But why should he be put to death? What has he done? Why? Who you think you talking to? Ah! You just tried to kill me? Maybe David was right. I need to be excused. What is a best friend? Are you willing to lay down your life for your best friend? This week we are focusing on 1 Samuel chapter 20, and we are exploring the friendship between David and Jonathan. As always, be blessed and enjoy. All right, welcome back to another episode of A Breath of Fresh Air podcast. My name is Earl Roberts II. <laughs> My name is Nikaz Gay. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why we did that just now, we're going to start doing it more, but we realize we never really say our name on the podcast. We just assume that, you know, everyone knows who we are or just figure out as the episode goes along. But we got to, we started to keep in mind for the first time that someone might be listening to the podcast that we should maybe introduce ourselves. You could kind of recognize, okay, that voice is Earl and that voice is Nakaz, and you just don't say the uh, two random guys. <laughs> just because you, you guys haven't seen our our faces in a while, if you haven't, if you don't know us personally, and even if you do know us personally, you probably haven't seen our faces in a while. But still, that's kind of why we did that. But we're gonna start doing it more often, so don't don't be alarmed. Um, yeah, man. So weekly thought. Be patient. Be patient. That's that's my thought for this week. Be patient. Because we live in a world where instant gratification has become a serious, serious thing. And it has its benefits, but it really has its drawbacks. And one of the major drawbacks that it has is we want everything right now. And we no longer want to be patient and trust in God that he will bring it to us. And patience is so valuable, man. Like, my last year and a half, two years, man, two and a half years, really. God just had me on a journey of patience. Just knowing that you trust in me and have faith in me, things will work out. And that's so important, man, because we see God's long suffering and we know that's really with dealing with his children. But still, do you know what it is to wait two years for something that 
you have the peace that it's going to work out, but you want it right now because you're like, my God, if you had me here now, like I could have been doing this, Lord. I could have been taking advantage of this opportunity. But God's like, no, man, if you if you trust in me and you trust that I'm going to have you at the right place at the right time, then you shouldn't even want it now because you don't even know what that entails right now. So patience is a serious thing in our day and age, man. Like, and it's something that I'm still not perfect at something that I'm still working on personally because yeah, man, the days of when you could order something on Amazon today and you like right now, and probably by first thing in the morning, it's going to be by your doorstep. Or if you're really lucky, it might be by your doorstep by 10 PM tonight. <laughs> the day's age is hard to have patience. It's really <laughs> hard because the site just made it so much more convenient. I think that's one of the devil tricks, honestly, but Go for it. Yeah, no. See, another thing about patience is is just knowing how to resolve conflict or how to just how to be angry, but sin not. You know, that's that's something that I, for a fact, this week the Lord has shown me or reminded me, because sometimes when I'm not in in altercations or when I'm not in like extremely stressful situations, I live under the illusion that I'm a patient man. Until something tries my patience and I see myself lose it or I see myself react in a way that I don't feel like reflects God, then I'm reminded, bro, you still have some work to do. You know, you still have to learn how to be patient and learn how to, you know, be calm and long suffering. And I feel like just off the strength that that's a fruit of the spirit, that's something that we all should be be mindful of, and, you know, be at a place where we want to. Just even if something frustrates us, even if someone is picking at us, even if someone is disrespecting us, even if, if someone has wronged us, we don't give full vent to our anger. You know, so in the NIV, in Proverbs, I can't remember the text exactly, but it says a fool gives full vent to his anger, a fool, fool gives full vent to his wrath. And it's so funny because I'm reading Proverbs and I'm just like, bro, you know, as a man, I, I have been taught by people in society that... You can't let things slide. Proverbs 29, 11. Appreciate it. Um, you can't let things slide. And that's being foolish. <laughs> you read the Bible and you realize, hold on, people was teaching me how to be a fool. That's all it was. And and you, they might, they might try to deceive you and say, this is how to be a man. But no, that's how to be a fool, bro. Giving full vent to your anger, telling someone all of your mind, like saying things that you cannot take back. That's mm-hmm. just foolish. You understand? So... In the same way, be patient and wait on the Lord. We need to be patient and just have temperance and just be mild-minded so that we don't, you know, allow ourselves to have rage or anger or or do things that allows us, do things that weaken our, our weaken the Holy Spirit to the point where we could be acting fully in the flesh. You, you hear times when a lot of people who committed crimes or acts of passion, you talk to them and they say, man, I don't even know how I did that, bro. I can't even remember. Some people may argue that that's, you know, demons or whatever, but I would like to add that that could be them living fully in the flesh, bro. It's a lot of times when it's certain things that we desire and the Holy Spirit telling us not to do this, but it's a very small voice and the voice gets smaller and smaller, the more passionate we are. And so um, by that standard, you know, that it, it is very important for us to be patient so that we don't live in the flesh and do things that are not of God and not of the Holy Spirit, you know? That's a big fact, man. That is a big fact. So it's going to be interesting how we're going to start doing these now. So like you guys know, we're, we're, we're in the story of David, the soon-to-be king of Israel, the man who killed the Philistines' champion Goliath of God. And last week, we had our good friend Dominic McFall on the podcast. Shout out to Dom. Um, But we saw how David was in a point where he had to start to run for his life. His wife told him, hey, my dad wants to kill you because David was the king's son-in-law. Go figure. And she showed him, hey, my dad wants to kill you. You need to leave. I need to leave now. We see how Micah let him down through the rope, kind of reminiscent of Rahab and the city of Jericho with with the spies. And so we're at a point now where David's on the run. And the reason why I say we're going to, it's going to be interesting we're going to start doing this because we're going to start incorporating some of the Psalms because the book of Psalms was attributed to David. And, a lot of, and we see a lot of the Psalms starting to come from this point in time in his life where he is anointed to be king. He's on the run, fearful of his life. And he wants, he just, he, he, it's, oh, 
It's a gateway into his mindset, what he was going through, how he was feeling. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like a lot of t- a lot of the stories in the Bible we covered so far, you get the perspective based on the situational context of probably what they were feeling. But this is like one of the first times we actually get to see from the author expressing himself, like the person in the story expressing himself and, ex- and his feelings. And you kind of start to see his relationship with God, how he was dealing with these situations as they were happening in real time. Because again, one thing like we, I mean, we haven't seen the podcast in a while, but the people in these stories that were going over, these were real life human beings who had their own personal flaws and traits and advantages, strengths or whatever. And they also have their own individual personal relationships with God. And so this one started from last week, but I'm just reading Psalms 57. This is why I say it's going to be interesting because we're going to be in Samuel and Psalms almost simultaneously. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to read 57. I don't know if you have it up. But um, we see David said, Have mercy on me, O God. 57 verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me. For I take for you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your rings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends me from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. And we know, again, that we kind of see that we know Saul is in pursuit of him. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts. Men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharper swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but I have fallen in I have fallen, but they have fallen into them themselves. My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and I will make music. Awake my soul, awake my harp, a lyre. I will I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over the earth. And in some of the things you can see, like they've dug a pit in my park. I remember last episode too, we see where Saul sent three waves of people to go try and kill David. Hmm. Then Saul himself came to kill David. Hmm. But whereas they set that plan to kill David, we see the Holy Spirit overwhelmed all three of those ways that those Saul's attendants or warriors to go kill David. And Saul himself was overcome with the Holy Spirit where they all started to prophesy about God's goodness and mercy and prophesying about future events. And people, it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets. Hmm. But we kind of see David saying, even though I'm in the midst of the lions, even though people pursue me, God, have mercy on me. God, my heart is steadfast. I will praise you. I will sing of you. Be exalted, O God. And it's interesting too, like, because to me, why I like it so much, and we're going to get into a couple more sounds as we go too, but think about it. You know you're about to be king and this guy is hotly pursuing you. At this current point, you ain't even really questioning God, like, why this happened to me? God, why you just don't kill him? Like, God, if I'm already king, why I just can't take over now? Like, you already, you already anointed me as king. But here I am saying, God, I know I'm about to be amongst Robin's beast. I take my refuge in you. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. I'm still going to praise and exalt you even though I'm going through this time. I will make music. I, I'm about to make music about this. Like we see, like we see David, like David letting us know, but here's what's gonna happen. Hey. I just, I just find it so beautiful, bro. Oh, I'm about to put this in 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 odd term, right? Yeah. You on the run, bro? Your enemy is your enemy is um, attacking you or trying to kill you, bro. But you go straight to the booth, bro. <laughs> You get you pick up the pen and the pod. You probably pick pick up your lyre, your guitar, whatever you want, right? And you just get to make your music, bro. And I feel like David. I like that about David because he's very expressive. Um, when I first start making poems, I'm mu- no, not music. When I first start making poems, everything was about God. Mm-hmm. When I started making music again as an adult after I graduated college, it was about God. It's very reflective of God. Um, but I I just feel like that's so that's deep to me because. I want to read. I want to read something really briefly. Go for it. Um, Psalms fifty nine. This is also related to um, 
1 Samuel chapter 19, which we went over last week. Mm-hmm. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Be my fortress against those who are attacking me. Deliver me from evildoers and save me from those who are after my blood. See how they lie and wait for me. Fierce men conspire against me for no offense or sin of mine, Lord. I have done no wrong, yet they are ready to attack me. Arise to help me. Look on my plight. You, Lord Almighty, you who are the God of Israel, rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Show no mercy to wicked traitors. And um, that's first one, Psalms 59, verse 1 through 6. It goes on for 17 verses. But these are, th- these are things that are going through David's mind. And Psalms, for all those who lightly regard Psalms or don't regard the, like how important Psalms is, I advise you to, to read through it and read through it multiple times because as a Christian myself, I am put in place, I am put in position sometimes where I am upset, where things are not going my way, where things where people are really conspiring against me, and the devil is is doing wicked against me. Sometimes mm-hmm. it feels like wicked is prevailing. Sometimes you might think, like, why is why is this evil thing happening to me? I am completely innocent. Why is my name getting um put through the mud? Why am I going through, through so much drama at work? Why is there so much drama in my household? Why are my children acting like this? You might have these questions, right? But it's important to know what other people who are in similar situations, how they reacted to it. Because we can find ourselves going down a rabbit hole and self-medicating in a way that is not healthy and that's not spiritual. We might go down a rabbit hole or, oh, I wish I had done that. And, and we might we might start sinning in our minds or we might start dwelling on, on the wickedness and then the devil, on wickedness, and the devil will prevail because what he wanted you to do is now is now happening. You know, he's saying, I'm going to put a snare in your way and it's going to cause you to get um, sidetracked from God. And then the devil wins in both times because he hurt you and it's going to allow you to hurt God now. You feel me? So what I like about Psalms is that we get to see how godly people react in righteous ways. We see David is complaining. He's venting. I heard a pastor say one time the venting is not of God. But he meant to say gossiping. He used the he used the wrong term, and he's mm-hmm. preaching about this. I'm like, no. Have you never heard? Have you never read Job? Have you never read Lamentations? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> David is venting. David is saying, God, these people running after me. They pursuing me. I did nothing to them. You understand what I'm saying? He calling them traitors, and he asking God to prevail over them. He's not even saying like, and and this is interesting to me because. You could see, you could be like, why isn't David praying that, hey, God, why don't you change their heart, work on their heart? No, David is saying, bro, avenge, avenge. You know why? Because not only are they causing harm to David, they are obstructing God's will. So when we when we see situations like this, we have to think bigger than ourselves. David is anointed to be king. David is someone who God handpicked. Saul is trying to kill David. He's trying to stop what God is doing. David is a middleman in all this. But Saul is actually being an enemy of God as well. And so when David say, and you'll see that a lot in Psalms, when David says stuff like, avenge my, avenge me and, and destroy my enemies and stuff like that, it's not, it's not from a personal God. I want you to just take revenge on, on, on people. Because at the end of the day, we are God's children. Now God has to go, you versus my other child. But the problem is, when somebody is acting like an enemy of God, mm-hmm. then you you're not my child at that point. You are an enemy to me. You are a snare to me. So when David is saying, avenge avenge me, you know, punish my enemies, it's really because these are enemies of God. We have to remember David was a man after God's heart. So the people like Goliath, Goliath was the enemy of David because he was the enemy of God. Um, case in point right there. So mm-hmm. so I love about Psalms, man. But I think we got a long chapter. We ahead. got a long chapter too. <laughs> so yeah, First Samuel 20. I'm reading from the New King James. Um, then David fled from Naoth and Ramlam. Because we know, we remember last episode, he went to dwell with Samuel. And he went and said to Jonathan, who was his friend, who was also Saul's son, What have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before your father, that he seeks my life? So Jonathan said to him, By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Then David took an oath again and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this. Lest he be grieved. For truly as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. I'm going to take a pause right there, right? So now we see David went to his friend. And I think it was more so of a, Let me see if you have also turned against me type thing. Mm. 
Because I know your father wants to kill me. Without a shadow of a doubt, I know your father wants to kill me. Because guess what? I'm on the run because your sister told me to run. Yep. And man came there to kill me. <laughs> so you might be left in the dark, but I know without a shadow of a doubt, your father wants to kill me. So now it's saying, let me come to you as my friend or my so-called friend. Let me see if you in cahoots with this guy or if you could be straight up with me. Hmm. And he's just kind of testing your loyalty like, bro, what I do? Like... Let me hear from you. What I do, like, let me know my sin so I can at least know why he won't kill me. Yeah. And you like, bro, you ain't doing nothing wrong. You like, never, never, that'll never happen. And that's this was my point last week. Cause last week at the beginning of the part, I was like, notice that Jonathan, notice how Jonathan was saying, or how Jonathan react to Saul telling everybody um, that he wanted to kill him. And now we see chapter twenty. Jonathan was like, no, that'll never happen. As if <laughs> my daddy already expressed that he wanted to kill me. Now, granted, there was an oath that I put in place, so you might assume that the beef is done. But being aware of who your father is, you know that he is angry to the point of wanting to kill an innocent man for no reason, obviously. And so for you to return and say, never, that'll never happen. Like, to me, that's kind of like, I don't know. I, I just feel like you just ain't self-aware or you just ain't aware of who, who your daddy really is. But like, you being ignorant. I think it's both. Because I think it might have been like, some might have been putting up a front. Because I, I know you and David cool. Mm -hmm. I won't kill him. I don't need you tipping him off. Right. Because we're going to see in first chapter two, he's like, bro, y'all, why y'all can scorn against me? Yeah. And on David's side. So now we see him, but I don't need you tipping David off. So I could, I could play cool around you and just, Jonathan just in the dark. But to your point, that's kind of like. I just don't understand why Jonathan's so naive. <laughs> that's a tripping me out, bro. Like, <laughs> I don't know, man. I really don't know. But we see David kind of test him like, yo, like, okay, since you don't get it, okay, let me show you. I'll, I'll show you that ain't, if I come around Saul, ain't much between me and death at that point. <laughs> if I get around him, he will kill me. Yeah. Now we see, so, so Jonathan said to David, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. And David said to Jonathan, indeed, tomorrow is a new moon. Um, to, is the new That's moon. It. Yeah. And it, and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat, but let me go, that I may hide in the field until the third day of the evening. And for you also want to know about the new moon festival, I think it's in Numbers 25. You can go back and read about that. Basically, at the beginning of every new moon, is a new moon signify a new month, and they had a festival. In Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> I think it's number 28, actually. But anyway, um, if your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asks permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he says thus, it is well, your servant will be safe. But if he is very angry, be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore, you shall deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. Nevertheless, if there is iniquity in me, kill me yourself. For why should you bring me to your father? Hmm. So, all right. My thing is, number one, right? I know a few times we talk about, uh, let's say, well, not even a few times. Last week, we talked about Micah and how Micah mm -hmm. deceived, right? I feel like, personally, they planning to lie, you know? And like they making up a whole festival for David to... Like, hypothetically do, but David is not in Bethlehem. He's not at a festival. He's somewhere hiding, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But this their way of testing the waters to see how Saul is going to react. Mm -hmm. The problem, what I truly have, right, is that Jonathan, this could be avoided, bro, if you just read the room. <laughs> if I tell you, if everything was cool with me, first of all, if your father tried to pin me to the wall once, right? That's a fuck, and you know that's a fuck, right? Everyone know that's a fuck, because you told me, you your father told you that you wanted to kill me, and you squashed the beef. I appreciate that, right? Mm -hmm. But if I tell you your daddy do that again, bro, why are you coming to me thinking I'm lying? You understand what I'm saying? Like, not to say he thought he was lying, he just did not believe him. Mm -hmm. He said, bro, my daddy, me and my daddy, we, we tight, bro. Anything my daddy about to do, he would tell me, right? And now they have to go through this whole, like, kind of scheme mm -hmm. just to prove it, but I feel like, this could be avoided, bro. Just you think the manga just leave his wife and run and hide in for no reason, like just to be just to be scared, bro. Like I don't know. I don't I don't see that happening. Yeah, and then we see it, he's saying, guess what? If something is wrong, you could just kill me yourself. We mm -hmm. don't got we don't got involved solve with this. If 
If something really, if I do something wrong, bro, you you could kill me. Yeah. Like I want, they say, want to die from Hansa, my friend at this point, <laughs> that's my enemy. Wow. It's just so interesting to me how lightly they just regard killing, bro. Like, like David is my boy, but he 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 kills for no reason sometimes. But like that's just how I see him, bro. Like, <laughs> you just saying, hey, this thing, again, it's kind of hard for us to fathom it because. One, the place in the world where we grew up. Because mm-hmm. think about it. If, you, if we was in the Middle East, unfortunately, we would have been less sensitized to it. Mm-hmm. Because I don't know what it is. It's tough to worry about a bomb hitting my house. Yeah. That's true. Because even, even where we come from, because we live in a small town, it's like we have everything at, at, at one point in time. We have the ghetto. We have the upper echelon. Everything just so close. Like they're mm-hmm. within miles from each other. So it's very easily easy for you to know friend or friends who have been murdered or who die right. by exactly. traffic fatality. But when I came to America, I met people who like literally never lost anyone in their life, bro. Like literally and only old people <laughs> die, bro. Like and, 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 and that's like what kind of made me realize that like we, me and you might not be sensitized to killing. Right. But we're less sensitive. We're like we're just sensitized to, to death. death. Yeah. On people dying because our mutual friend, I guess it's okay to say his name, mm-hmm. Michael. I said the last time, so don't matter. <laughs> Michael, when he was like, yeah, man, like, I feel like every other day someone dies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, it's kind of true, you know? Yeah, but it's so normal, though. It's yeah. very normal, bro. Like, I remember last year around this time, bro, I had a really good friend who had passed away in a, in a traffic fatality, bro. Like, that kind of, that, that really bothered me. And it bothered me and it bothered a lot of people because it's like, you have friends who, who leave, right? Some somewhere along the lines, you just make an assumption that there are some friends who just ain't gonna go, bro. You understand what I'm saying? But then every now and then, like life reminds you mm-hmm. of how shallow and how like how fickle life really is, bro. And you know, but David, David does, bro. I thought I not even that, you know. I talk about killing, like it seemed like they, but it, mm. like we know David has killed many people, and I, and I just to be fair, bro, I feel like I don't, I don't know that. I don't think it's possible for you to kill that many people and psychologically, like this don't impact your brain in some type of way. So this might desensitize you like to like to death and stuff like that. So to him right now, he like, bro, if I gotta get killed anyway, bro, I'd rather my boy kill me. But Nakaz would never say that, bro. <laughs> I would tell you, bro, if if I do anything wrong, bro, come kill me. And when you come to kill me, I won't be here, bro. You ain't gonna find me no more, bro. For real, because I would already know if I do something wrong or not. But if I'll I feel just like, vanish. Yeah, I'll just vanish, bro. Like, no matter what, though. You know what I mean? If I feel like I'm innocent or guilty, I ain't gonna be here when you come back, bro. True, truthfully. Because I ain't dying for that. You see what I'm saying? I ain't dying until God says it's time for me to go, bro. What? They ain't gonna let somebody kill me, especially my boy. No, bro. <laughs> but yeah, I get again. The relationship they had and the times they was living in. So John says, far be it from you. For I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon you. Then I would, then would I not tell you. He John says it again. If I know my daddy had some evil intentions, I would let you know. So as far as I know, mm-hmm. everything cool with my, with my daddy. But we say anyway, we still going, we still, the neighbor said, John, who will tell me or what if your father answers you roughly? Then they came up with the solution. Then Jonathan said to David, come, let us go into the field. So both of them went out into the field. Then Jonathan said to David, the Lord God of Israel is a witness. When I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow or the third day, and indeed there is good towards David, and I do not send to you to tell you, may the Lord do as much, hold on, may the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan, but if, but if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you away, that you may go into safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your hand, your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord cuts off every one of, of the enemies of David from the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. And the reason why that part was so important, right? I know it kind of gets kind of befuddled when you read it, right? But the importance of that was, again, typically people who watch these medieval shows and stuff is kind of the same principle. Jonathan knew that David was going to be the next king. Mm -hmm. You could kind of see God's countenance upon David. That was clear for everyone to see. So they knew like, you're going to be the next king. When a king comes, when a new king comes to power, 
especially if it's not from the sitting royal throne, the sitting royal line, they kill everyone in part of existing family. Yep. Because again, typically you don't want to have anyone come and have a claim to the, rightful, yeah. to the throne. Yeah. Oh, this person, no, we ain't doing that. Mm-hmm. Kill everybody. <laughs> so even though it was a rightful heir, and the crazy thing about the rightful heir, really, really and truly is Jonathan mm-hmm. and his children. Yep. So Jonathan saying, guess what? When you come to bow, don't like don't spare my family. Yeah. We ain't coming against you, but just be kind to my family. And we're gonna see that this is repaired in the future. Because it's actually gonna become a it's gonna become an important point when David actually does take the throne. Mm-hmm. But John saying, spare my family, please. But that's that that's the importance of that whole section right there. Yeah, and, and that's and for a little bit more context, if if this is your first time tuning in, the reason why David is on the run is because Saul wants to kill David because Saul had already been promised, prophesied to by the prophet Samuel that his throne will not will be taken from him. Will be taken from him. So basically, and his family. And his family. So basically, his son Jonathan, who is a trained warrior, who is the rightful heir, will not be king. And Saul is anxious about that, very anxious, and he wants to kill David because he, at the same time, he thinks that this is what's best for Jonathan, you know. And at the same time, who wants to be wrong, bro? Um, when when Samuel prophesied that his throne would be taken away from him, that was a punishment for his wrongdoings. Right now, he's trying to justify everything that he had done. But he's wrong, you know, and it's going to happen. There's nothing he can do to change it. But he doesn't know that. He feels like if I kill David, my problem is done. Not knowing that even if God allows you to kill David, bro, there will arise another man to take away your throne. Or, or you still might not get the throne, bro. Like, you still won't get you it. You still won't get it, bro. Like, Israel might be without a king, like, in this hypothetical situation. <laughs> the day is when Israel had no king. <laughs> Real talk, like. But so I'll try and hard to avenge Jonathan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So now in verse 17, now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him and he, and for he loved him with as much as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new moon and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. And when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed and remain by the stone of Ezel. Then I will shoot three hours to go to the side as though I shot at a target. And there I will send a, a lad saying, go find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on this side of you. Get them and come. Then as the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. But if I thus say to the young man, look, the arrows are beyond you. Go your way for the Lord has sent you. And as for the matter which you have spoken of, indeed, the Lord between me and you, you and me forever. And then David, hit, verse 24, then David hit in the field. And when the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat at the feast. Now the king sat on his seat as other times, one seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose and Abner sat by Saul's side. But David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something had happened to him. He is unclean. Surely he is unclean. <laughs> and, and as it happened the next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty. And Saul said to his son, Jonathan, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat either yesterday or today? Saul mm. says, no, two days in a row. Now, hold right. on. <laughs> something is up. Something, something wrong now. <sighs> so Jonathan turns to Saul. David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go for our family has a sacrifice in the city. And my brother has commanded me to be there. And now, if you have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. And we see, then Saul anger was aroused against Jonathan. And he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Mm. Talking about your mummy, bro. You don't like, got to bring my mummy in this, bro. Like, I'm like, wait, Saul, what? Why is your son, bro? <laughs> you choose that woman, you know, bro. L- literally. <laughs> literally. Do I not... Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? Mm. For as long as the son of Jesse lives on earth, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. Now, therefore, send and bring him for me, for he shall surely die. And the Kazi's earlier point, we see how Saul is using Jonathan as the muse in order to kill David. Mm. We see Saul, Saul saying like, 
you, if anyone, should want him dead. I'm already king. Yeah. If he lives, you won't be king. So I'm killing him for your behalf. And Jonathan and, and John's like, no, you kill him because you want to kill him. Right. You want to kill him, bro. You using me as an excuse to kill him. It plain as day, you want to kill this man. And I already talked to you about this. You have no reason to kill him, but you have a desire to kill him beyond that, beyond reasoning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, this, 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 this the part would make me laugh, though. Mm-hmm. J- j- see, <clears throat> first of all, Jonathan lie, right? Yeah. But, I, go on. Because in other verse, when you read down, it sounds it sound like David actually did go to Bethlehem. And when you read uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, he actually did go. And oh. he actually came back. You see what John said? Oh. I'll go down and then come back. Oh. When you come back, you say, come back and hit in this place <laughs> as you did before. So right, technically, right, they didn't yeah. lie. All right, yeah. So they ain't lie. They ain't lie. I give them bail. I, I, yeah. I Y'all just erase all of that on my mind. Because when I read this, I'm just saying, bro, you guys coming up with a plan just to test the waters. Uh-huh. But at the end of the day, they was telling the truth. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Even better, right? So y'all come up with this plan, right? It is the truth, but it it, it, it has a motive behind it as yeah. well. So it's twofold. Saul don't know whether it is true or not, but Saul automatically say, boy, all right, y'all two in it together, bro. Exactly. Saul ain't, but like in Saul mind, there's no reason there's money in here today, right? But think about it though. Let's say it was true. If this man just tried to kill me a week ago, Right? Just because it's the new moon. What make you think I come in here so you can kill me, bro? What change since the last time? You see what I say? Like, what change, right? Exactly. But let me tell you, as Saul shop, Saul purposely ain't tell Jonathan because I feel like Saul wanted Jonathan to try to lure him to come back because Jonathan was coming to David anyway saying, bro, no, my daddy don't want to kill you, bro. Blah, blah, blah. Like, everything cool, mm-hmm. right? Hoping that that might um, get... Appease them. Appease Joe, um, David and lower his defenses. And he said, yeah, you know what? It mm-hmm. might just be like last time, X, Y, Z. But if I'm David, I'm thinking, all right, you missed me three times, bro. I ain't sticking around for the fourth time, bro. Like, I ain't sticking around for that. You know what I mean? But Saul just automatically just think of the worst and say, hey, you all two conspiring against me. That mm-hmm. is clear. But Saul don't even have no proof of that. I it guess, is true. I guess Saul also saying, though, like, make it more used to king. Mm-hmm. To be excused from my absence, you're supposed to come to me. Right. You went to my son. Right. And Jonathan, you mm. ain't come to me and tell me David missing. Mm. You just give him permission to leave. You waking with David. Yeah, that's true. That's true because why you ain't come to the king? Exactly. Like, like this so, might this my feast. Yeah, so you were you you purposely avoiding me. Like exactly. you ain't got no permission for me not to be. <laughs> exactly. So Saul's so like, no, 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 no. So Jonathan arose from the table and I cannot. Did. Now we see Jonathan mod. <laughs> no, hold on. I, 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 I skip a verse. No. Then Jonathan answered Saul father and saying, why should he be killed? What has he done? Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Saul said, he had enough of this. Yeah, dog. So, so his, his, his spear don't have no name. Like how they say. You understand? His spear can go to anybody. Ain't nobody exactly. name on that spear, bro. And exactly. I, I just want to ask a question, bro. Was, was Saul a good fighter, bro? He had to be. He cannot. He cannot hit for nothing, bro. <laughs> he can't. Boy, he cannot hit a sitting duck. You understand, bro? Like, man, like, what is up with this guy, bro? Like, bro, you old like for four. You bait me. You <laughs> like how you bait me. <laughs> you old four with this man, bro. I see why you didn't want to go fight Goliath. <laughs> man, it, it wouldn't end good. No. Not, a, not if that's your shoot, if that's your shooting percentage, bro. It wouldn't it wouldn't have been a good a good series for you, bro. <laughs> uh, by which so we see then Saul cast a spear to kill him. By which Jonathan knew he was determined by his he was it was determined by his father to kill David. Jonathan say, oh shoot, you even want to kill me now again? Like that, it don't be like, it don't be But that, that that proves that this ain't this him killing David wasn't about Jonathan mm-hmm. because he was willing to kill Jonathan. Because if you kill Jonathan, Jonathan ain't gonna sit on the throne. Exactly. So what difference it make? You understand? So you can see that it was deeper than Jonathan, but I'd kill you and all, but like I'd kill anybody that's in the way of me killing David. Exactly. So I, go I would say that one more time. Go for it. I'll kill anybody that's in the way of me killing David. Bro, don't worry, we're going we go. <laughs> for real, bro. Anyway. <laughs> so we see Jonathan rose from the table in fast anger and ate no food that second day of the month. Mm. But he was grieved for David because his father had treated him shamefully. This man so mad he ain't even eat no more. Mm. I, I I wouldn't even stay at the feast yeah. no more, period. Like, you just try to kill me. Like, to David, I out. <laughs> I out. I, mm-hmm. You just try to kill me in front of everybody? No, nah, man, I out. 
I know, and then uh, I and then putting yourself in Jonathan, putting myself in Jonathan's shoes now. I just earnestly tell my best friend, but my daddy ain't gonna kill you. I vouch for you. Mm -hmm. Now I see that you really won't kill him, and now this is pleasing because now I have to tell my friend, but I gotta send you away. Like, because it literally ain't safe for you to be here no more because my father wants to kill you. Oh my. So, and it was so in the morning, Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David. And a little lad was... This <laughs> 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 poor little lad, I'm loading in the middle of. Yeah. Then he said to his lad, now run, find the arrows which I suit, shoot. And the lad ran and he shot the arrows beyond him. And when the lad had come to the place where the arrow was which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out after, after the lad and said, is not the arrow beyond you? <laughs> and Jonathan cried out after the lad, make haste, hurry, do not delay. So Jonathan lad gathered the arrows and came back to his master. But the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of the, of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the lad and said, go carry them to the city. I'd have been mad if I was the lad. You come out here to shoot two, three hours. Just tell me I got to go back to the city <laughs> without you. Like, what you bring me out here for? I tell you. As soon as the lad had gone, David arose from the place toward the south, fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. They kissed one another and they wept. But David more so. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, since we have both sworn in the same, in the name of the Lord, saying, may the Lord be between me and you and be between our descendants, between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed and Jonathan went to the city. Yeah, that must be a really sad time. Like, I can imagine David being really anxious, like having anxiety and just being sad. You know what it is? You married. No, truthfully, you know what it is? You 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 do uh, you do a lot of things the right way. You understand? You 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 try to live for God, right? And you do the right things, bro. But that was to your downfall. That's a sad moment, bro. You you can't even lay up under your wife. You gotta be in the field. You gotta be away from all type of you know, just away from everybody. Mm -hmm. Cause the king wanna kill you. That's the worst person in your whole country to wanna kill you. You could have beef with people and live a long, fulfilling life. Beef with the king. That ain't going too, that ain't going too long because it could be seen as treason or mutiny. Anybody who side with you against the king, you know, and so people would have the, um, they would have reason to turn you in or to betray you, you know, or not to harbor you. Man, and just thinking about it too, like this. Imagine what David would feel because we read the sound, so we kind of know what he was feeling, right? But this is the last time David was going to be in the city or close to the city until he is king again. Yeah. Well, until he is anoint like on the throne because he's already anointed king but tell he's on the throne this yes man and now you're saying like you might have some hope like i can imagine Dave, like some like you i can know when things ain't fully concrete like you like 95 percent shall be still on that five percent like maybe i can maybe i don't have to run mm -hmm. maybe you know it's all a misunderstanding god comforts soul so i can come back and at least dwell in the city i gotta go to the past but now you're like Nah, man, like, no, you really got to go. Hmm. Ain't no more staying here from you. You don't know what's ahead of you. You don't know what this journey going to, you don't know what this journey going to bring. But you still know you got to trust God as you go along. Um, In hindsight, we can see why David had to go through this without spoiling too much. We're about to go through a bunch of these, uh, we're about to go through this the story now. But in that moment, you don't know. You don't know where your next meal coming from. You don't know where you're gonna get water from. You don't even know where you're gonna. You literally don't know where you're gonna lay your head when the sun when the, when the sun goes down. You don't know how far you're going. You don't know how close you're staying. You don't like. You literally don't know anything. And then you gotta do this by yourself, though. You gotta you gotta do this alone. But it would've been different if he say, "All right, I taking my wife with me, some friends, or maybe if you had kids, and y'all go on this journey. This just you and God, bro." You got to travel this alone, but you do not have a pair, bro. And I just feel like that's interesting because as Christians, bro, it, it, it be times when God take you out of a situation, but no one else is taking out of situations, bro. You there and you got to walk alone, bro. Like as a person, the cars, I feel like, and this might be a psychological thing because I, I'm a twin, but I don't like to be on my own, bro. Like you see what they're saying? Like not to say I can't be in a house by myself. Like I ain't talking about that. I talking about. I don't like to be on a path 
where I have no one to relate to me. You see what I'm saying? Like, even off the strength of my name being the cause, the fact that no one else's name is the cause, if I get any type of pushback, I have no one to relate to on this. Like, you know, like how they say misery love company. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's that might be what I'm trying to say. Like, I that's, want I that's want the company. Whole favorite scene. <laughs> I want company on certain things. If I get persecuted for my beliefs, it would be easy if I know how other people has ex- what they did to, to get to overcome this. But when God calling you on a unique mission, bro, mm-hmm. the only person you can rely on is God, you know. And so if you a person who actually need that that company like me, then this might like sometimes it's like a really sobering moment. Like it's like a really it's like you going to rehab just to be if God shaking you your dependence on all these other people so that you could walk and um build a reliance on him. I had a friend just this week told me that when everybody because he was um he's a Bahamian, we went to we went to school together. And um he was saying most of his friends were upperclassmen. And when it's like, it was like a year when everybody just graduated and he was left and all his good friends left, you know? And so like, it was a, it was like a pretty lonely time for him. You know what I'm saying? Right. But but for real, bro. And like, and like we, as we talk, we, we, we came to the understanding that that was God trying to show him, bro. Like, like sometimes I got to take everything away from you just to get your attention. You see what I'm saying? And, And it was, it was through those type of exercises that give him the muscles and the strength and the faith in God, you know? And that's just how, but that's, that's one thing with life. That's one thing with life, bro. Like, it's it's like, you know, Christians, we love to call everything a season. You see what I'm saying? But you might have a season where you in a city with all your friends there. Mm-hmm. And one person get married and as soon as one, some person get married, but everyone will start getting married. It's like, be like a domino effect. Yeah. This person go, <laughs> this person move, take a job, this place and, and that place. And you realize, bro, this was an error. But it wasn't a, 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 a everlasting era. You understand? The, the, the time is, is done now. Now we have to move on to a new chapter. David is in a painful place because he his, um, his life of old, from shepherd boy to um, one of the captains in the king's army to, to the fame that he had, mm-hmm. is being completely stripped away from him as he is living as a fugitive. Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? It goes back to the psalm you read. Arise and help me look on my plight. You are Lord God Almighty. You are the God of Israel. Rouse to punish yourself, O nation. Show no mercy to the wicked traitors. But you're going to read down further saying, You are my strength. I watch for you, God. You are my fortress, my God in whom I can rely. God will go before me and will not let me go over those who slander me. Like, I, you are my strength. I will praise you, God. You are my <laughs> fortress, my God whom I can rely. And to your point, like, you're going through this in solitude. You're going through this in solitude. But in David's case, I mean, we know why he had to go through it. We'll be going to get there. But it's important sometimes when God has to rip, when God has to rip you from, a, from your current surroundings in order to put you in a position where, you need, where he needs to mold you to do the task that he has called you for. Like Abraham, he had to bring Abraham out of Ur. Mm. He had to bring Moses out of Egypt. To, give, to send him, <laughs> he had to bring Moses out of Egypt to send him back to Egypt. But he had to humble Moses' his heart. Mm-hmm. And now it's crazy. He had to rip David from Israel to send him back to Israel to be the king. And so when we're going through these struggles, when we're up in it and it's about to begin, David's about to go through his time of trouble, mm. as we so call it now, God knows why. Mm. And it's so hard to see it when we're there and when we're going through it, why we have to go through these struggles. But... To me, it's encouraging to have David's perspective on it. Have mercy on me, O oh God. Be with me. You are my strength. Because I know it's only through you that I can have the solace to go through this struggle. You are the one who brought me to it. And it's so cliche, but you're the one who's going to bring me through it. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's powerful. Like, David, in these moments, we're st- we, we're really got, we're really starting to see the peak into why he's calling man after God's own heart. Yeah. And I can just end it on this psalm. Perfect. Psalm 9, verse 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in the times of trouble. Times of trouble. Saul's mind is made up. He wants to kill David by any means necessary. And there's nothing anyone can do to change that. 
this is a lesson that Jonathan had to learn the hard way. When Jonathan tried to speak up for David, it almost cost him his life. Because at this point, Saul is willing to kill anyone that supports David. But we'll talk more about that on the next episode of A Breath of of Fresh Air. Tonight's episode included voice acting by your hosts, Earl Roberts and Nikaz Gay. Remember to go ahead and research on your own in order to get a more firm understanding of tonight's episode. And if you enjoyed it, make sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. You can follow us on social media at a breath of fresh air pod on Instagram and B O F A P O D on Twitter. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to see you next week.